Hi everyone, I'm Amy P. Wilson and I am the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative Fellow at Lewis and Clark Law School and assist with the Animal Law Clinic, directed by Professor Kathy Hessler. Thank you very much for joining in on this presentation about aquatic animals, a global perspective. So first of all, happy World Aquatic Animal Day. We appreciate that there is a lot happening in the world right now and a lot of challenges and extreme hardship and pain. And while we don't want to make light of the pandemic and everything that's going on, we think it's important to realize that people are looking for opportunities to learn and share and ways to advocate for both humans and animals alike. And in that vein, we hope that today is a way for them to do that and that the presentations and the resources that we have on various sources are useful and that they get people excited about the day and help lift and raise the platform for aquatic animals. So I will say a special shout out to the clinic students, animal or clinic students who have put together today and worked extremely hard on it for a while now and worked on the resource packet, which is on the website www.worldaquaticanimalday.org. And I will also encourage you to check out the presentations by Professor Kathy Hessler and Professor Garrett Lavis, which are also posted on the site. And a very big thank you to Chelsea B. Davis of Veggie Stuart Theatre for organizing our community event, virtual event. And there's going to be a lot of exciting things happening today. So hopefully you can join in on some of them and share as you want and be involved as you can. So let's jump right in. This is the kind of overview of what I want to discuss during my presentation. And what I will say is that aquatic animals generally and the topic is a huge one and very complicated and complex. For many people, it's a personal issue. It impacts on culture and religion and belief systems and even economic and political beliefs. And of course, in that way, it's important to take cognizance of that fact and realize that this issue is a big one and we can only really scratch the surface on it. And we encourage you to do your own further research on it and look at other organizations. There's a lot of really good information out there and some of the resources obviously are in our resource pack, but really just to encourage you to get excited, excited about it and if you're interested, then you know carry on on this journey. And we're also gonna be touching on some foreign jurisdictions. So it's important to realize that we've got students from all around and we're just giving, again, just a brief kind of high level summary and none of it's intended to be legal advice. It's purely for informational and educational purposes. So let's jump into part one. What is World Aquatic Animal Day? And I'm just gonna to refer to it as WADE because it's a lot easier. Well, it's in a nutshell, an annual day dedicated to aquatic animals. It's a project of the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative or ALI and the Animal Law Clinic at Lewis and Clark Law School together with the Center for Animal Law Studies. And we are trying to raise global awareness about these often forgotten non-human animals. So why do I say often forgotten? Well, in many ways they are, uh, not only by the law, but by society generally. We don't usually spend a lot of time with these animals, at least not the same amount of time that we spend with their terrestrial counterparts. So they live in habitats that are far away from ours. We don't see them every, every day. And in that way, they are lesser impacted in our advocacy and our education efforts, and specifically our law, as we'll touch on a little bit later. So it's very important that we raise them at least to the same kind of platforms and discussions that we're having about other animals and their habitats and the impacts that our activities are having on them. And of course they play a very critical role in both our society as well as in our ecosystems. And 
they're not just important as a group. They're important as individuals with their own intrinsic value and worth. And I think it's important to take a step back and talk about aquatic animals and what do we mean when we actually say that, because I kind of had this assumption that we're talking about fish and I might even say fish during this and mean it more broadly. But it's a huge category of animals. There's a lot of different types and I'm going to mention some of these in some of these categories from amphibians to frogs, toads, newt, salamanders, crustaceans, including crabs, shrimp, coral, finfish, sharks and others, marine mammals, polar bears, otters, pinnipeds, uh, so we have mollusks as well, mussels, mussels oysters, scallops, cephalopods, including octopi, reptiles, turtles, uh, sea stars, sea urchins, even corals and jellyfish, sponges, and aquatic birds and insects, so flamingos and seagulls and even zooplankton at the very basic level. Similarly, when we think of their habitats, we would tend to think of the marine habitats, so the oceans and the seas, but they live in various bodies of water, fresh water and marine water, and we even need to think about the ones that are in captivity, whether these are in facilities such as restaurants, schools, uh, entertainment, or even within our own homes. They are widely used and abused, and they face a multitude of different threats, and in some ways, very different threats to their terrestrial counterparts. So thus there's a very urgent need to give them the proper consideration that they deserve and to reflect this through our legal and policy and other efforts and even within our advocacy efforts. I think there may even be a gap for those that advocate for animals uh, within their own knowledge and efforts in this realm. And I myself was guilty of that. So I understand and we need to, of course, consider our interactions with them and our treatment of them and really consider holistically our, the impact that we are having on them. And as we want this to be an annual event, we've decided on a different focus for each year. For this year, we're looking at aquaculture and broadly that refers to the plant and animal based agriculture, whether it's in fresh water or marine and whether it's on land or in water itself. Giving a very brief introduction into the uses, I think we're all familiar with some of the ways that we utilize animals generally, but I think it's important to also understand that some of the ways we don't often think of and also just simply the scale. And I think with aquatic animals in particular, the scale is really staggering. For companion animals alone, the American Pet Products Association, their most recent survey from 2019 to 2020, essentially said that 11.5 million US households, so only in the US, own nearly 140 million freshwater fish. And then approximately 19 million saltwater fish. And then nearly 10 million reptiles as companion animals. Those amounts alone are staggering. The amount of millions and millions of aquatic animals within the US home system is huge. So we're starting to really see the impact just of the ones that live within our four walls. And this of course, in many ways is impacted by the wildlife trade and in some instances, the illegal wildlife trade where animals are captured from the wild and then go through the entire process to eventually end up in people's homes. In entertainment, uh, we would predominantly think of dolphin shows, and there's a picture there on the slide, but again, even in aquaria and zoos, recreational fishing is a huge source of, of entertainment for many. Uh, estimates run into millions of people that do recreational fishing around the globe. For food, the predominant sources are either aquaculture or wild caught fishing, and I will touch on both of these in further detail throughout. And uh, perhaps another surprising one is research, science and education. I think it's, it's very much surprising to a lot of people that fish and 
particularly specific species, are currently accounting for the highest number of animals used in research. And again, we would often think of, of mice and rats, and of course, obviously those are important, but I think it's important to also know that aquatic animals are being utilized, and there's reasons for it. They're actually becoming favorites for, for reasons that are very detrimental to them among animal researchers. And even cephalopods, the, the increase in cephalopod research is, is increasing dramatically. Other uses include for decoration, specifically ornamental fish. People love to have them in their home, love to display them. They're used in cultural ways, and this is a myriad of different cultural ways and value actually culturally, and we'll touch on some of these when we get into the global perspective. And even in medicines, these animals are utilized, and, and some of them are, are extremely even cruel the way that they are done. And in a lot of ways, these utilizations that I've just mentioned overlap with the threats. But without repeating those, uh, other threats that they face, and these are to both them directly, these animals, as well as their habitats, include climate change. We, a popular example, and you'll see on the slide there, is polar bears. That's one that we've seen. It's devastating videos about this. We are increasingly seeing this become more and more of an issue as global warming increases. Even our waste and pollutants, and these are from our various activities, not, not just one, it's not just agriculture, it's, it's from our plastic pollution, it's from oil, it's, it's from so many different sources of pollutants, both marine and freshwater habitats. Noise, again, acoustic pollution has specific impacts on, on species such as whales and others even. Shipping was a surprising one for me that I actually hadn't thought of, but shipping alone comes with so many different threats. One of which is the animals just simply being hit by these large vessels and even smaller vessels. I mean, it's, it's quite crazy to think about the ways that we are impacting on them and, and our activities are, even by us doing things like building dams and, and other human structures which we rely on. And the loss of food brings me to the next point, which is our wild caught fishing. And with that comes a myriad of threats, including entanglements and bycatch, overfishing, illegal fishing, incidental killing, even intentional killing to reduce the competition. Uh, poaching, of course, is, is major. And among this list, I think there's various other examples that could have been included, but hopefully if you consider them either individually and then collectively, the impact that we're having is huge and it's only continuing to increase as time goes by. And as I mentioned, the theme is aquaculture. So Professor Kathy Hessler is, is talking about this in her presentation and, and so is Professor Garrett Lavis. And I really do encourage you to, to watch both of those. And uh, I think I want to note here is that in many ways, aquaculture is being considered as the lesser of the evils. So I mentioned some of the major threats that we have from wild caught fishing. So aquaculture is kind of seen as, as the better option and, and more preferable and it's one that's being pushed through various legislative policy and industry efforts and I think uh, it's dangerous to think of it that way because with it comes a host of other issues which need to be considered and and, and obviously the regulation of it is also problematic. So with that in mind I think we need to move to uh, some of the global perspectives of aquatic animals and here really we, we've got some great insight from uh, and research from our clinic students. They put in a lot of effort and I think it's really important to look at these issues globally, starting at an international level. So why is aquatic animals an international issue? Uh, I think it's actually a very good example because aquatic animals migrate. They move between different spaces, particularly of the ones in the ocean. And whether this is forced migration or natural migration, this is important because they then impact on shared and unowned territories and then become political. They also are trade and utilized across borders by humans, whether they're alive or dead or their body parts. So, so really as an international law subject, it's a very interesting one and it touches on a lot of different aspects and I've listed some of them here. Predominantly we talk about wildlife and conservation when we're looking at international animal law and you'll see that throughout some of the treaties which I'll mention later. 
but also as a food source and that leads us to animal health because that's really how we look at regulating them is, is the impact on animal health and subsequently the impact then on human health. As an, as an international trade instrument, as I mentioned, we're trading them across borders and then climate change, obviously looking at our activities, the impact that they're having on countries and globally. So without going into too much detail about international law generally and some of the issues is, is that a lot of the conventions and treaties and customs and laws are really tough to enforce and tough to agree on. And making an observation in that regard, how we see aquatic animals generally impacted by international law is regulating the sea and regulating the take of these animals and fishing, so specifically wild caught fishing. And one of the main ones we're looking at is the Convention of the Law of the Sea, as the name suggests, talking about the sea, but obviously has some protections for the environment and then the management of natural resources and that word resources is also important to see how we view these animals. And CITES, or the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of both wild animals and plants, as the name suggests, regulates trade. So trade is allowed as long as the species are essentially being protected as a whole, at least that's in theory. And within that would include specific species of aquatic animals. One of the more predominant treaties specifically relating to animals such as whales is the International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling, which is governed by the International Whaling Commission. And that's one which you may have seen in the news a lot about country, specific countries putting out, such as Japan or other countries acting either in contravention of it or in terms of the exemptions granted by these laws. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on these other ones, and I've listed some more on the other slide. I think really just to kind of observe the general trend of how these issues are regulated at, at an international level, where we're talking about conservation, we're talking about fishing vessels. And here's some more, again, law of the sea. So regulating the, the international relationships between these countries, fish stocks, the words are important, the way that we refer to these animals. And then of course there's more regional efforts which are specific to certain regions. And I haven't touched on this here, but at an international level, there's also other issues with uh, illegal fishing and um, vessels. There's a large amount of, of um, problems and enforcement with these laws. So moving on to aquaculture, there isn't a international treaty specific dealing specifically dealing with aquaculture and animal welfare in this realm. And an important one to look at is the World Organization for Animal Health, or the OIE. And really their main focus is on animal health and diseases and essentially because of the human use and impact thereof. But they have included and taken some steps to regulate and deal with animal welfare. And they do have a specific code for aquatic animals. So I would encourage you to take a look at that one. And then other than that, that the efforts largely relate to food safety standards, protecting consumers, fair trade practices, and the like. So you start to see that these animals aren't featuring for purposes of their protection, but rather for uh, very much anthropocentric views and uses. Moving away from the international level and looking at some of the foreign-based laws, legislation, and issues affecting and impacting on aquatic animals, in the USA, and you'll see this again trending as we go through the different jurisdictions, fishes and aquatic animals are generally excluded from most of the US laws that offer animal protection. And this even includes the farmed animal legislation, which is very minimal to say the least. The Animal Welfare Act uh, excludes invertebrates and fish that are farmed are, are doubly excluded because the definition of animal excludes animals used for food and fiber. So fish are not even included in this realm anywhere at all. And then in the other legislation which regulates humane slaughter and others which regulate the transportation of farmed animals, the 28 hour law, again, fish are not included. So even among minimal protections, these animals simply aren't included. 
we do see some protections offered to species of aquatic animals that fall within the Endangered Species Act. And then again, within the category of marine mammals. So if aquatic animals fall within that category, they will receive some protection. And I will put a disclaimer that there are certain instances where they won't, and it's not for all species. So even within some protective laws, which are working well, there's still problems. And that's at a federal level, at a state level, there are again some protection for farmed animals and some of them include fish to some extent. The state animal cruelty laws largely will exclude aquatic animals from protection as well. So again, problematic. We already have this invisibility of these animals and then even the law is, is not protecting them, it's, it's still giving them this invisibility cloak. And moving on to aquaculture in the US, uh, aquaculture, they are not a big producer. They are in fact a very minor producer on a global scale, but they are a major consumer of aquaculture products. And there's specific reasons that they're looking at growing these industries and particularly in certain states. And we're seeing a big push and we're seeing a lot of pushing for offshore aquaculture. And, and Professor Hessel will talk about this in her presentation. But importantly, if we're looking at these animals themselves, their welfare really is subservient or non-existent. It's not included. So we're looking at, on one hand, at a push of this regulation and this, sorry, at a push of these industries, but then on the other hand, we're not looking at regulating the welfare of these animals. So that, that provides a huge gap in the, in the law. And then of course, with, without the law, the content of the law being problematic, there are major enforcement issues with these when they do exist. In Chile, it's a, it's a good example of where the aquaculture industry has literally just boomed from being almost non-existent in the 70s to now being one of the top global players and it really being a major, major industry within Chile itself. And it's the second largest producer of salmon after Norway. So it's really a big player, at least in certain species production. And when an industry is that important to an economy, it becomes very difficult almost to advocate for welfare for these animals. And we, we start to see a lot of pushback because of the economic interests. And we'll see this kind of theme running throughout in different countries. So some of the regulatory framework, there, there's some that regulate fisheries and aquaculture. There'll be some that protect the environment and this will, get, will be a, a global threat that you'll see in different countries. There's certain kind of ways that animals are protected either indirectly through the environment or directly, but largely regulatory gaps, welfare issues, and diseases that arise from these operations, and then the use of antibiotics. That's a, that's a particularly big one, and um, one which definitely needs to be addressed if we're looking at pushing and increasing production. The EU is the leading region for consumption of seafood. So one fifth of fish production in Europe is from aquaculture at the moment. So it's something I'll point out when we get to China in a little bit, but right now there's two predominant sources, which is wild caught and aquaculture. And wild caught has been the lead so far, but we're starting to see aquaculture increase. And the main producers within the EU are the, are the UK and Greece for marine aquaculture, and then France, Italy, and Spain for shellfish. And you, again, you see the different species in the different jurisdictions. The regulatory framework as the EU, each country and nation as a sovereign nation will regulate things at a national level, but there will be certain directives that apply to them. And just one example of a few that would apply in this context is that council directive. And you see that that relates to animal health and the control of diseases. So those are the things that we see regulated and regulatory gaps at the EU and of course when it comes to welfare of these animals. Moving on to China, which, is a, which plays a hugely important role in the biodiversity of the world. There's more than 20,000 aquatic animal species and they actually have established quite a significant amount of marine reserves and that's something we also need to be thinking about in the protection of these animals is designated space 
for their habitats because obviously it's one thing to talk about their protection and their welfare but if we're talking about wild animals and they don't have protected habitats or protected spaces it doesn't really mean much so we're starting to see that as an important legal issue in addition to advocating for their welfare obviously and as i had previously mentioned and i think it, it is important to call out is that the symbolism within different cultures of these animals is, is hugely significant in the way that people relate to them and, and in some ways will offer, want to offer greater protection for species that have specific symbolism and significance to them. And those are just a few there and we'll touch on a bit in New Zealand. And yeah, I think it's always very interesting to see how the different countries' relationships with specific species. But here yeah, we see again within their regulatory framework, they have some wildlife protection laws and they will provide specific species with protection and we again will see some endangered species getting more protection protected species then there will be some regulation of in terms of fisheries law and that's usually just regulating the kind of take that one can have from the ocean whether it's numbers or species or limits or times of year those are the kind of things that we generally see regulated in fishery laws and the permitting process and licensing around that. And then of course, environmental laws, which look at protecting the environment broadly. They don't necessarily look at protecting species as an individual species, which is how we might want to advocate for them as advocate, as animal lawyers. And this is very major within aquaculture is that China since 1991 has produced more aquaculture products than every single country in the world combined. It is a major or the biggest player in this industry. So their regulations and what they're doing there is obviously hugely impactful uh, because they're obviously supplying to the world. And similarly, they have a major wild caught fishing industry as well. And there's just a few statistics. And I think, as I mentioned previously, in 2019, they became the only country whose total aquaculture exceeded the fishing. So now we're starting to see a shift of the sourcing of these animals from the sea or from wild caught fishing to aquaculture. And I believe this is a shift and it's actually been predicted by the FAO that more will come from aquaculture than from wild caught fishing because of the depletion of the resources within our ocean. One thing that arose from this was because of the growth in aquaculture, there was a huge amount of pollution within the environment. And now they are looking for a green transformation of the aquacultural industry. So they've kind of gone through that process of a major burst within the aquacultural industry and now needing to deal with the consequences of that and regulating that more efficiently if it's going to continue. So looking at New Zealand, they have a very long coastline and one of the largest marine jurisdictions in the world. And this is quite huge, but 80% is estimated of the indigenous biodiversity to be found in the sea. So obviously very important with a huge amount of different types of sharks and turtles and dolphins and the most diverse seabird community within the world. Again, I'm gonna call out in the Maori culture, the sea is often considered to be the foundation and source of all life. So hugely important for the people traditionally and indigenous communities. And with that generally comes a, a level of, of respect and understanding. And whether that you know, continues throughout is, is important to consider in our regulation and it's important to be sensitive to these issues when we're looking at regulation and enforcement of them. Similarly, they do have some wildlife protection laws, some environmental laws. As with the US, they have a specific law relating to the protection of marine mammals and a fisheries act. And again, as I mentioned, reserves. So they have specific and designated protected areas for these animals. It is the fastest growing agriculture, the fastest growing industry within a seafood industry and significant contributor to employment, incomes and export earnings. Again, the money matters and what the economic growth of a protected industry will definitely impact on the legislation, policies and regulation coming out of it. Our last country is South Africa. It, the fisheries industry is hugely important. It em employs tens of thousands of people and is worth billions of rands. The South African rands is our local currency. And
And it's important to call out here that aquatic animals are really seen as a resource, by, at least by policymakers and, and government in many ways, to be exploited. They talk often about the blue economy and the ocean economy, and those words, as I mentioned, words matter we, we, when we talk about that. And uh, this can be seen even slightly below in the slide. We even talk about the Marine Living Resources Act. So we don't even refer to these animals as animals. Uh, we refer to them as living resources. And that attitude is really prevalent in, in the laws and policies that come from this. And, and particularly uh, Operation Fakisa, as it's called, is uh, an initiative which is seen to, in the next couple of years, increase the production and use and exploitation of aquatic animals. And similarly, we, we use a lot of freshwater and marine species. Abalone is one uh, species of animal where there's a huge amount of issues in the illegal trade. And it's, it's something that's really been devastating domestically and internationally and uh, is a huge law enforcement issue and, and even impacts on national security and the wildlife trade more broadly. At a, at a level of national legislation, the Animals Protection Act is the predominant piece of legislation looking at protecting animals. And while farm animals are included, which they aren't in a lot of jurisdictions, fish are excluded from the act. So they again do not even fall into the definition of animal and get the protection, the minimum level of protection as other animals do. And this is replicated in the Performing Animals Protection Act, which as the name suggests, regulates performing animals. So again, they're not even, they're invisible, they're not even defined as animals. And I already touched on the use of the word living resources. I think similarly, the regulation follows the pattern of protecting threatened or protected species. There are some reserves and marine protected spaces and there's some environmental laws that potentially impact on protecting the environment, but not really looking at the welfare of fish. And there's an intention to grow the aquaculture and fishing industry. And there's some draft laws in the pipelines that the government is looking forward to pushing soon. So with that kind of grim summary of the global realm, let's look at some alternatives. And by alternatives, I mean alternatives to traditional seafood. And I'm using fish broadly here to mean all different types of aquatic animals, so please bear with me. There's predominantly two types of alternatives being explored, and those are the plant-based ones and the ones that are actually cultured or lab-grown. And why is this important? Why are we even looking at alternatives? Aside from the sustainability issues associated with the industries, which again, some of the presentations will touch on. There's been a huge and major growth in pushing for non-meat or non-seafood alternatives. And on the slide, we see just some statistics from the USA and the UK and Canada and Portugal and Hong Kong. And this is not just these countries. These are just very symbolic of a major movement that's happening around the globe. People are either changing to plant-based diets because of their health or because they're realizing the impact of our treatment of animals and the lack of animal welfare, or they're concerned with the environmental impacts. Whatever it is, there's been a huge shift and there will continue to be a major shift in this. And we'll see it continuing to grow in, in various parts of the world. So what does that mean? Well, look at some of the examples here. It means you can basically get tuna-free tuna. You can get that real seafood taste without without the, the animal involved. Uh, and if, I mean, I haven't tried all of these, but I think you can pretty much get everything from like crab cake, vegan crab cakes, to vegan fish and chips, uh, to vegan fish soup. So I think there's something out there for everyone if it's available to you um, in your area, uh, um, give it a go. And then we, we look at the other side, which is cultured or lamb grown fish. And this wouldn't be considered to be vegan in the sense that it actually comes from an animal. It's cultured from an animal and grown in a lab. And these are some of the headlines. So 
people seem to be quite hesitant about lab-grown meat, so it would be interesting to see how they think of lab-grown seafood and the consumer issues around that. And is this the future? Well, who knows? But with it comes a lot of interesting regulatory issues. What do we call these products? Are we allowed to call them the same thing as their animal-based counterparts, their terrestrial-based counterparts even? Can we call a burger made from mushrooms a burger? Can we call milk made from almonds milk? It doesn't come from a cow. A lot of people in the industry, even government and other proponents are saying you can't, that it's confusing to consumers and that it shouldn't be allowed. And it's actually a consumer protection issue. And we're seeing a lot of laws trying to be passed to protect these industries from other industries, plant-based industries, and even other cultured industries to be using these names and also to be labeling their products as such. And another dimension that's confusing as to which regulation, who would regulate these industries? Would they be regulated under the food? Would they be regulated under medicine? Who is the correct agency to deal with this and answer to these questions and enforce the laws? And all of these are very exciting and interesting legal questions and these cases happening all around the world and laws being passed constantly and a lot of efforts. So it's something that you'll just continue to see as these alternatives rise. So some recent developments, and I'm not gonna go into these, I just think it's interesting to see all the different things happening within the aquatic animal realm. Some of these are happening very, very recently. The, the seizure happened in towards the end of February. Uh, the, the eliminate shark finning. Shark finning is a major, major issue and a huge welfare and protection issue. And that happened towards the end of last year. And again, even aquaculture was seeing happening in the courts. Uh, these operations being sued, the government's being sued for allowing them the lack of proper regulation, the escapement of these animals and how that impacts on wild populations of animals. So the courts and the law are constantly evolving in this area. It's definitely, definitely a very exciting area of law to be involved in. And yeah, some, some of the laws are looking to ban captivity of cetaceans at least, so whales and dolphins. Uh, getting wild meat off the menu. That's a very controversial and very hot topic right now. And it's not just for terrestrial animals. It's important to include aquatic animals within our consideration there too. And as I mentioned previously, the International Convention on the Regulation of Whaling with Japan com commercially re resuming whaling again. That was one which caught a lot of attention. Even in Brexit, it's coming out in relation to fishing rights. I've got debate. Uh, the shark net one I thought obviously was interesting to me because it happened in South Africa during the lockdown. The whole country is in lockdown at the moment, but they're lifting the nets. So that's giving some opportunities at least to the wildlife there. China started a ban in a 10 year fishing ban uh, due to the overfishing within the river. And then there's other, other steps such as reducing and eliminating banning plastic bags, plastic stores. This is happening all around the world and it's all impact on them. And the final one was in relation to the whale jail, which again, caught a lot of media attention. So it's just a few takeaways. The scale of the issue, and I'm hoping that you will manage to look at some of the other presentation because Kathy goes through the, the numbers, the FAO numbers, and they are staggering. And I think it's really important to grasp and understand the scale of this issue and the impact that we are having on a daily, yearly and basis, which is exponentially growing. There are major, major issues with regulation. As lawyers, we care about that. We need to have proper laws in place and they need to be properly enforced because the current framework is not only posing a threat to these animals, but it's actually posing a threat to humans and our environment more broadly. And it impacts on a bunch of other areas as I already have discussed to you. So we need to actually consider this holistically in our approaches and when we're making laws to tackle these issues to go forward. And I won't touch on these, but I think uh, one of the ones which was surprising even to me was the huge amount of human rights implications impacted by aquatic animal issues, whether it's the illegal fishing or poaching. Uh, I think it's, it's dramatic and, and I do encourage you, whether you're an animal advocate or a lawyer or in whatever realm you are, to at least try and grasp the issue because I'm struggling with it each day to really 
it's it's major and it's very important and i think it's important for all of us to know and be aware of because it impacts on our future and with that i think it's important that we do at least raise aquatic animals to a visible platform in our efforts educate others as we can whenever we're advocating for animals include them in this advocacy we need to include them in our laws as lawyers and the science needs to inform the policy. There's a growing body of scientific evidence around these issues, whereas previously there wasn't, or at least it wasn't visible. Uh, there was a lot of work done on terrestrial animals. We're seeing a lot more work done on fish, a lot more work on aquatic animals, cephalopods, and we, can, we need to use that research, and it needs to inform policy. And, and similarly, it needs to reform the law and include better protection we need to advocate for their welfare if we're looking at the mass utilization of these animals we must have welfare in place it's very important for everyone not just for them not just for humans and again proper laws that are properly enforced where there's transparency accountability protecting our endangered species and dedicating resources and the final one I want to touch on, and which I did already, is the alternatives, but how we need to advocate for this in our laws as well. So whether it's the food alternatives, whether it's testing alternatives, whether it's entertainment alternatives, all the utilization of these animals needs to have alternatives, dedicated research and funding and resources. And that's the only way we can kind of look to going forward in their protection if we're parallel to all these regulatory spheres also looking at the promotion of these alternatives. And with that, thank you for listening to my presentation. And I encourage you to watch all the presentations and be involved in all the different efforts today that you can in a way that you feel comfortable. And uh, I really do hope that you've learned something and that you enjoy World Aquatic Animal Day. And importantly, that you stay safe during this very critical and trying time and continue to advocate and be strong and have a great day.